I think I got it. I think I think I got the thing set. Is is this working right? Did I do it right? Is it over here? Hey, there it is. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever time it might be, wherever you are out there. Welcome back to the live stream. My name is Jeff Fritz, and uh, this is C Sharp with C Sharp Fritz. How you doing out there, chat room? This is, of course, I want to make sure I, I say this right up front. This is a discussion about all kinds of things, .NET, Visual Studio, Azure, that hopefully will answer your questions. We'll, we'll chat. We'll have a little bit of an AMA up front here for about 40 minutes, and then we'll get in. We're going to talk about, we're going to talk about getting started building a Maui application today. We're going to look underneath the covers a little bit and see how the various pieces go together that make up a Maui project. And then we're going to, we're going to start building a sample application. This is a monkey finder application. Everything Xamarin in the past was monkeys. And we brought that forward into .NET Maui and we're going to build a, a simple application that loads data, binds data from the internet and lets you drill in and do some some interactions with that. And today we're going to start with just getting data into our application and getting it displaying properly. I'm seeing a bunch of folks hanging out here in chat. Let me bring up, um, where did my mouse, where did my mouse pointer go? There it is. Let me bring up the chat room. My goodness. who? there's a lot of folks here. Um, there it is. There's the chat. Let me bring, let me bring them in over here. They're right over there. Hello, hello. So many folks here. And they're already scrolling by over there in the view. Let me say hello. Stephen D's here on YouTube. Sofiro on Twitch. How you doing there? Balat. Uh, salam to you, a Kazakh residing in Turkey. Hope you're having a good one. Tokyo Rock is here from on Twitch. And I, I love the little cheer emotes. That was cool. Vidraz, hello. Uh, Daniel on YouTube. Let's go indeed. Nikita, how you doing there? David, uh, everyone's a jumbo. Okay. Kayla, thanks. Bye. How you doing there? Patrick, hello, hello. Ota Beck, yes, let's do it. From Uzbekistan. Hope you're having a fantastic afternoon, early evening over there in Uzbekistan. Uh, Daniel, uh, greetings to you in CZ. Is that is that Czech Republic? Is that what you're saying by CZ? I'm not sure about that. Um, Orthodox is here from Serbia. How you doing there? Uh, Bunkboy17 on Twitch. How do we do, guys? We're doing all right. We're doing all right on this this Monday morning. Always start the week fresh, write some code together, get things started, feeling well. Patrick is here from Germany and on YouTube. Good to see you. Too much hassle. How's it going there on Twitch? Triton2112, good morning to you. You're on TV. That's right, Bunkboy17. Look, it's right over there. Uh, <laughs> will we be using the Maui Community Toolkit? Eventually, yes. Not right off the bat, but we will. Um, Mark Mark Dickin, he's an SAP migration consultant and on YouTube. How you doing there in UK? LeBanc Thierry in, uh, I think you meant hello from Belgium. Not hell from Belgium. It's Belgium's not a bad place. <laughs> Just forgot the O. <laughs> it's 2 p.m. in the UK. Fantastic. Bonjour to you. Is it is it Phil? In Quebec, hello, hello. Uh, Dongo Rath is here from France. Stevens from Australia. We're um, I'm gonna get some music uh, going here in just a second. How you doing there, Craig in Birmingham, England? Let me get some some music playing. Of course, I'm gonna play some some groovy uh, synthwave music. This is from the synthwave playlist of Stream Beats. This is music that's just kind of groovy that we're going to have in the background so that when I pause and, and stop talking for a little bit, you've got a little bit back there to kind of fill the gap. So. Yeah, there we go. So this is music that's royalty free, uh, DMCA free. You can use it wherever you'd like. Twitch, YouTube, Facebook, doesn't matter. Check it out at streambeats.com. There's all kinds of genres there. This is the Synthwave playlist. I also play um, an EDM playlist or a rock playlist behind my my videos. Um, just so it's you have a little groovy, a little bit back there to, to kind of add flavor. Big thanks to Harris Heller and his team of creators for making this music that we listen to today. The beard looks good. I'm, I'm about to cut it off, actually. I meant to cut it off last night, but... Um, might have been a little distracted. There might have been there might have been a an American football game last night that distracted me a little bit from uh, <laughs> taking care of those things here. 
Um, so thank you, Joe, on YouTube. Uh, Triton, hello to you on in Peru. Uh, Kayla's from uh, Birmingham in the UK as well. This is good music, says Vidraz on Twitch. Thank you. So you'll it, on your platforms, if you're on Twitch, if you're on YouTube, you'll see the Restream chat bot drop messages in with information about what's being said on the other platforms. This way, you can chat, you can ask questions, you can even talk cross-platform through that chat bot. So everybody gets to see what everybody's saying. When the chat comes down here, you, you'll still be able to see what's going on um, on the uh, on the two platforms. Uh, Stephen asking, any idea when .NET Maui will be... Actually, the uh, the timer didn't pop up there on the screen yet. That's that's not it. It didn't it didn't reset, and I don't have the background. There it is. Uh, no, it shouldn't be thirty minutes. Hang on, we'll reset that real quick. We'll reset that real quick. It's supposed to be forty. There we go. So, the ask me anything timer is up. So for the next forty minutes, I'm just going to be answering questions from chat. Stephen asks, any idea when Maui will be supported in Windows 11 ARM? Not showing up in the Visual Studio 17.4, 17.5 preview. Um, they are actively working on it. it. Just takes time. I I do not have a schedule for that. Patrick on YouTube asks, MVVM, will we be talking about MVVM? Yes, that's going to be coming up. It's uh, it'll probably be in the next episode. We'll we'll get to MVVM. So. Pro Security. Hello. Welcome. Jimmy Engstrom is here. How you doing there, Jimmy? Good to see you over there on Twitch. Um, I'm going to be on a stream with Jimmy tomorrow with plenty of shenanigans, I'm sure. Uh, a good tech chat and, and interaction with uh, Jimmy, Jessica, uh, our friend Richard Campbell, um, and, and two amazing uh, women who um, work and, and help market and drive a bit of the community the .NET community uh, interactions and promotions um, Sarah Fats and Dee Dee Walsh will be joining us tomorrow um, uh, Jimmy do you want to drop a link to that stream so that folks can can tune in tomorrow um, PJ's here from Nigeria and on YouTube good to see you final stack how's it going there the Neo is here on Twitch as well Felix Patrick tuning in from Nairobi Kenya hello hello Felix Something to be said. I think we've got so we've got Australians, we've got folks there from Kenya, so we've got Australia, Africa. I know we've seen I, we've got a couple folks from Europe. I think we saw um, some Americans, some North American folks tuning in. Them neos in Belgium, yeah, yeah. So I think I think we're missing some some folks in Asia and um, South America. If we get those, we've got all the all the major. But major, we've got all the continents set except for Antarctica, and uh, they, they really can't get streaming over in Antarctica. Um, yeah, M MD MDS Ubuntu is here from Poland. Good to see you. Um, there's a question here from Hikmatulu uh, and, and Varpikov. Wow, that, I, I hope I pronounced that right. There's the and there's the link to the Valentine stream. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let me. I'll pause for this. Uh, Amiral is here from Malaysia. There we go. We've we we've got all. <clears throat> all we need is a South some South American folks. We've got it covered. Um, I think we've got. Um, we've got a couple good questions here. Let me go to the question here from Hikmatulu. Um, should I learn C sharp for mobile development? So if you're doing mobile development with C sharp, you're going to be using .NET Maui. Previously, you used Xamarin. Um, .NET MAUI is the successor of the Xamarin capabilities. Um, should you learn it? I think it's a great tool to have available to you for mobile development. I don't think it should be the exclusive technology that you learn and use for mobile development. There's certainly things that you can only build and put into applications that are natively developed in um, Objective-C or uh, uh, Java and building with Android. Um, so you can build in reference and use those when you're building with .NET MAUI. 
Um, you can include those those native references and take advantage of them. Um, we're not going to get into that. We're not going to go that deep into the topic in this series. This is really a beginner series. Um, but by using C Sharp for mobile development, you, you're able to build and deploy to four platforms at once instead of just one. So that's pretty cool. That's, that's a very cool um, advantage you have as a .NET developer using .NET MAUI. So we, th we think that's pretty important. We think that's pretty cool to be able to take advantage of and deploy and use all of those platforms at once. Amiral asks, um, is C-sharp for web applications in Python the best combination? No, I, I wouldn't say that I wouldn't say that there is a best combination right now. Um, the best combination for you is going to be based on the technologies that you know best. There are many, many different technologies that you can use to build websites, to build back back office services, right? Those back web services that support websites, RESTful services. You can build with C Sharp, Java, JavaScript, TypeScript, um, Python. Take your pick. Use what makes you happy to build those. Um, be, and they, there are advantages and disadvantages of each. Some are significantly faster than others. That's okay. The raw performance of those technologies doesn't mean as much as can you be productive with them. If you can't be productive with them, then is it really that valuable a technology? Is it that is it going to help you? Are you going to be able to build and deliver an application appropriately with that? So choose yeah, choose the things that make you happy. And that's why one of the reasons why for a long time folks were really excited about using Node and Node.js because they could learn just JavaScript, build on, on the front-end application, build on the server-side application, and they have one technology set that they can use front to back. Now, some of that got, got contaminated a little bit when you think about all the different JavaScript frameworks and tools that you needed to get all of that to talk together and, and run optimally. So it ended up being a, a bit of a soup to work through all of that. Um, Osempu, hello to you in Mexico. You're working and watching the live. Hey, how's it going out there in Mexico? Good to see you. Um, Steven, just finished watching, fished watching. Fish watching? Finished watching the appearance on Nick Chaps' podcast. You really enjoyed it. Thank you so much. Yeah, I joined Nick Chaps uh, two weeks ago now. And... Uh, for a podcast discussing live streaming, um, the .NET community, .NET features, um, and, and got to have a, uh, some candid discussions and conversations about it. And always happy to, to engage and talk to folks more about what's happening and what you can do and what you can't do and, and how, how I've been able to grow an audience and, and take advantage of the live streaming platforms. It's, it's been it's been a medium that's been very good to me. So, how you doing there in Nepal, Dev? Uh, is it a, a, wow? I can't pronounce that. Uh, Finn is here from Finland. Finn from Finland. Hmm. Um, you're you're from Asia, also. Yes, I, I saw Ramesh. How you doing there from India? Good to see you. Uh, I ask for one thing. I get a lot of things. I do, and that's okay, Thania. We can deal with that. The four platforms. Yes, Mark. So when you build with .NET MAUI, you can deploy to Windows, Mac OS, iOS, and Android. Those four platforms. Um, and we'll dig into that when we get to the demos here in, in about a half an hour. Uh, how you doing there? CK Lamb in Malaysia. Timebenders here from Calgary. How's it going in, in Calgary? Oh, my goodness. Uh, hope uh, things are going well in Alberta. David, how's things in, in Kisi, Kenya? Hello, hello. Oh my gosh, and the Neo is here from the Matrix. I don't have any spoons for there to not be any spoons. Um, uh, Ronald in Barbados. My goodness, is it... You having a nice warm day there? Uh, Gure is here from Bulgaria. Fantastic. Um, with a little bit of luck, I might be in Bulgaria 
uh, this year. I might be visiting. Uh, Cicero, how you doing there? Brazilian in Germany. Hello, hello. Do we have any Brazilians in Brazil, though? Trying, trying to get some folks in South America. We've got, I think, just about all the continents except South America. Uh, how you doing there? Uh, Sherizal. Franz is here from Bolivia. And uh, where'd it go? Uh, Andrejan from Bosnia and Herzegovina. Moshur from Bangladesh. How you doing there? Atal in India. You want to be a trainer like me? Fantastic. That's great. Um, it takes a lot of work. It lost a bit of studying. Um, and I find that that good trainers, good speakers are not just that you, you don't just know the script, but you're confident and you've practiced in the tools and technologies that you're working with. That's why I prefer to, to speak on web, blazer, ASP.NET topics. Those are my bread and butter. Those are the things that I've spent the most time on. .NET MAUI, like we're going to talk about today, I've spent some time on. I've practiced a little bit, but I'm, I, I'm not an expert that's doing it every day. There's, there's a couple other folks that are experts at that, but I know enough to talk about it and, and, and train and get folks up to speed. Um, Mark says, million dollar question. Uh, where is the best place to download and see sample dynamic, data dynamic sample apps for MAUI? The best place to get sample apps? Not sure. Couldn't tell you. I'm going to, we, we will have a sample app, and if you're watching the recording, we will have a sample app on the, the GitHub repository. You can find the link to GitHub uh, in the YouTube description just below. And if we, let's see if, let's see if the bot's working here. If we run the GitHub command, there we go. Stream elements pops that in. Did it pass it over? No, it didn't pass it over. Um, I'll paste that so that you get it on YouTube as well. There you go. There's a link to the GitHub repository where the samples, um, the, the sample app that we're building will be residing. I am setting up and scheduling an eight-hour workshop that we're going to host in the beginning of March over on my Twitch stream. We're going to go through and build a different application, and we're going to get that standing up and running in, in eight hours with all kinds of openings at the end of that so that it so that it's it's complete to a certain extent, but you'll be able to extend that, tinker and learn, and add new features to that going forward. So I like to do that with sample applications that I show, is that especially that I make open source and available, is here's the way that the, the lesson ended, but it's, it's complete, but you can extend, make it look better, change it so that it suits your needs and your goals. So you'll be waiting for me. <laughs> Popped in before your first meeting. Have a good one, Napalm. Good to see you. Uh, there we go. Carlos is here from Ecuador. Good to see you, Carlos. There we go. We've got six of the seven continents covered. Thank you so much. Um, scrolling through here. .NET and machine learning. Any future trends? Yes, lots of machine learning. ML.NET is, is growing. ML.NET, the framework that we use for machine learning with .NET, is uh, it's quite powerful. There's a lot you can do with it. I use it. In, um, I've used it in a couple different applications, and you can find it uh, in the application that I build over on my Twitch stream. Uh, that application is ClipTalk. I use that to suggest streamers for folks, and uh, I have a blog post about how I've implemented that, showing the sample that I, I learned from, extrapolated, and, and turned into a uh, suggest channels feature for ClipTalk. Um, and ClipTalk is a website that allows you to find Twitch clips about other channels so that eh, maybe you find some new content that you enjoy or you're able to go back and, and find those highlights from channels that you follow. So it, it, they're working on adding new features, growing it, making it faster. There's a lot more that you're going to see over there. Um, any plans for adding Linux as a target platform, asks Nanook. This, we get this question, and we're going to see it six more times before we're done stream today. Um, 
it is the top requested and they're they're they've handed that off to the community to be able to build and uh and support it is completely open source and it's there's folks in progress working on that in the community um the 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 maui team is is trying to get other features completed as well so not not currently planned from what i know um eight hours training sounds interesting yes so my my longer training workshops um of course we have breaks in the middle there um will we cover building applications start to finish and all the code all the samples are available for folks to download and try out so those are um they, they take a lot of work to build um and uh it, it's an endurance race for a uh, for a presenter here but i i love presenting like that i love those interactions and uh we'll be doing that at the beginning of march um how you doing there mahesh in india uh currently working on dotnet maui and web app single shared application this station so um it i'm not going to get into the blazer hybrid capabilities with uh with maui today we showed a, a sample of that two weeks ago but uh two weeks ago three weeks ago it was some time ago i'm, I'm trying to get back on a regular weekly schedule here and um you'll you'll see today we're gonna we're gonna be all xaml today which for a web developer like me feels feels a little weird <laughs> so we'll we'll dig in and and cover that we may get into a little bit of hybrid work later in the series curious drive pointing out oh, you wound me yes the philadelphia eagles lost yesterday championship match they had a lead for the first first half of the game and uh just couldn't hold it in the second half and and fell apart uh it was it was a shame but uh Congratulations to Kansas City on the win. Um, folks here in Philadelphia are second guessing so much of that game. So it, it, it is what it is. So Stephen asks, is WPF still in use these days? Yes, it is. When should I choose WPF over Maui? WPF only works on Windows. It's the Windows Presentation Foundation. So you would choose WPF if you want uh, to build something that only runs on Windows, uses that same XAML interaction, and you want to take advantage of uh, GPU, high graphical processing capabilities, um, those are the times that I would choose WPF. You'll get a very similar experience with .NET MAUI targeting Windows. So when should you choose WPF over MAUI? If you're the other thing I would throw in there would be if you're also supporting older versions of Windows. If you're targeting .NET 10 and later, you're going to be great with .NET Wow Maui. There is no .NET Wowie. You'll do great with .NET Maui, with uh, .NET 10, with Windows 10 and Windows 11. Can we start over? Okay. So that would be where I would go. I. I Going forward, I, I would prefer .NET MAUI over WPF and would only choose WPF if it if it was something that I needed because I was targeting an older, now unsupported version of Windows um, because only Windows 10 and 11 are supported at this point. I think I have that right. Um, does Z, ZXing barcode scanner work for iOS devices? Don't know. I'm not familiar with that. Um, Bitwise, the other big thing, I hope they add support for open open GL context. Um, I can't speak towards that. Will I do a DDD project workshop? Asks Felix Patrick. I have done I have done architecture workshops in the past. Um, did um, oh my gosh, DDD is why am I blanking? Domain driven development. Um, I could do one. I would want to measure the interest in it first. Um, 
Yeah. Uh, Finn on YouTube asks, can Maui apps be published in Azure App Service and folks download it similar to a progressive web app or only from marketplace sites? So iOS and Android applications, you must install from a marketplace site. Uh, Mac OS and um, Windows, you can make download packages available. For both of those operating systems, folks will get warnings when they try to install your application. So you could publish to app service for those two, let's call them workstation-based operating systems. Um, but for, for iOS and Android, you're going to have to go through the storefronts. How you doing there? Is it Panha on in Cambodia? Welcome. Good to see you. Orthodox Forever on YouTube asks, I saw that Maui added a maps component, but I'm not sure which map providers does it support. I need Azure Maps for my app. You know what? I don't know. Um, .NET Maui component. .NET Maui map component. Um, do, 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 do. Looking here. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, there's a mock framework you can specify mock provider it's not clear who the provider is looking at the docs here it's a good question um, I would have to defer that to the Maui team I, I don't know it's not listed here oh it uses the, the native map application on that operating system so it'll be Google Maps on Android. It'll be um, Apple Maps on iOS. And um, there's a Maps app on Windows and, of course, on Mac. So it, it redirects to use the native app. So you need Azure Maps? I yeah, don't know. I, I don't know how you would swap in. Um, well, you'd get it on... You'd get it on Windows Maps. I'm not sure. I, I would have to do some research on that. Sorry, I don't have more details orthodox. Uh, how you doing there, Emmanuel from Togo? <clears throat> yeah, the Eagles blew it. You're right. Um, Mark says, I'm thinking that XAML sounds like all code and no GUI. I really prefer graphical tools if possible and available. Um, you're right. And that's why folks prefer uh, Windows Forms. Windows Forms is still very much supported on Windows 10, Windows 11, and folks really enjoy using it for exactly that reason. They can get quite... Um, it, it's very much a rapid application development tool because you have the designer surface that you can work directly with and move forward with and, and use to build... A user interface quickly um, so it's Windows Forms is very very popular for that um, but the WPF Maui presentations using XAML it's the exact same interaction that web developers have where you write HTML content and there is no native renderer in, in or graphical interface I'm sorry there is no graphical interface in Visual Studio Visual Studio Code so you can't really interact with it. There, you, there is a designer surface that does pop up. I haven't. Hang on, let me just look at this for a second. When I, yeah, I don't see the designer surface in Visual Studio anymore. There is a designer view that pops up, but it is it is very much a um, a reflection of the code that's being presented there. UWP is an island app. Data access is very restricted. Yes, but you can still make requests to other services to interact with. So, yeah, .NET Wowie. <laughs> ah, there, and .NET 10. Ah, there you go. See? Speaking speaking fast and I'm, I'm making mistakes. That's right. Good to see you, M3 Speed King. Hello. Are there any disadvantages to .NET MAUI to be aware of? Asks Vidraz. Um, .NET MAUI is still evolving. There's 
there, there's capabilities that aren't that, that aren't quite there yet. Um, I don't know them off the top of my head. I can't. I couldn't point to them. But um, it's growing. It's evolving. There's new releases that are coming every quarter. There's new features being released every month um, as they they push to evolve it. A, a major disadvantage of it because it's not the native development tool for Mac OS, iOS, Android, um, there, there is a little bit of um, catch up that happens between the release of the technologies for those devices, for those operating systems, and .NET MAUI being compatible with them. So as new, as new operating system features and new operating system capabilities are released, .NET MAUI won't have those features until a little bit afterwards. So there is a little bit of catch-up to do. Uh, yes, Avalonia is out there as well. There's a couple of um, frameworks that you can use to build and target and take advantage of um, being a .NET developer with user interface frameworks. Avalonia, Project Uno is out there as well. Uh, the Uno platform, I'm sorry, that's what it's called. So you can take a look at those and they help you build um, and target different frameworks as well, different runtimes. You're welcome, Stephen. S-Man is here and uh, says, since I uploaded my project to .NET 7, I think you mean updated your project to .NET 7, you can no longer install the APK on your Android phone. What can you do? Um, you can't install the APK targeting .NET 7. Um, that doesn't sound like the change to .NET 7 is what 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 created that problem. It's, uh, there's um, there's a pointer inside your project that points to the version of the Android uh, runtime that is targeted. You might be targeting a newer version of the Android runtime than your phone supports. Um, I would want to cross all the dots on those cross and make sure that, that you've got that you're targeting a version that is supported. Um, I typically have been targeting, I think it's Android 31. I think that's the version number that, that I've been targeting. Um, uh, where'd it go here? Um, actually this says 21. All right. Android 21 is what this one does. But I would open a GitHub is issue. That's a good way to start um, to see if you can get some help with that. You get a message that the app is not compatible. There you go. That tells me that the you you built and targeted an Android SDK that isn't available on your phone. You, you're right. You're building for a version that is newer than your phone supports. Is what that sounds like. Um, good morning, honestly. Uh, is this for complete C-sharp beginners? Um, I, I try to stay very beginner-friendly, yes. Yes. So, uh, yeah, it uses maps provided by the OS. Thank you, Lewis. Bitwise, uh, Apple Maps is so bad, why does that even exist anymore? I, I, I haven't had problems with Apple Maps recently, so. What happened to XAML Live Preview? I don't know. That's a great question. And I I did see that it was pulled. I'm not sure why. Will we be able to use asynchronous delegates in .NET MAUI? Yes. Absolutely. It, those, those are a language feature. You can use them. Yes. Um, you absolutely should be able to use them. Okasoto, how you doing there from Berlin? Uh, guten Nachmittag. Good to see you. Um, why hasn't the Maui team offered the option for the app to run as WPF Maui for Windows 7 development? Because Windows 7 isn't supported. Um, pure and simple. Windows 7 support is, is no longer a thing. Is a data grid available in .NET Maui? Um, I don't think they, they don't have a native component for that, but you can get a data grid from the various control vendors. They have grids available. Um, Visual Studio Blend. What, what's Visual Studio Blend? Um, doo 
How are configuring build servers for Maui applications? Um, so, uh, Ramesh with that question. So, the trick with build, configuring a build server is it needs to be able to, to build and target the operating systems that you want to deliver for. That means for iOS development, you actually need to be running uh, to target and deliver iOS. You need to have you need to have a Mac build server for that. Now you can set that up so that you do have a a Mac, you do have an Apple machine somewhere on your network that it can connect to and build off of. And there's ways to configure that. There's instructions for that on Microsoft Docs. But for Windows, Mac OS, and Android. You need to have those tools, those SDKs for those available on your build server. So you want to, on the command line, run .NET workload, .NET workload install, and grab those Maui components. When you run .NET workload list, it'll show you the list that are available, and you can find those. They must be on your build server so that you can build. Once you have those um, Maui workloads available you'll be able to build and deploy to those operating systems how you doing there chris jones good to see you there is a ui designer in in blend okay um okay and, and but it is yeah for some reason it was removed from visual studio and i don't have insight onto why it was removed or if it's coming back um, let me see here. Um, Mahesh uh, asks, I may want to know if there is any direct way Entity Framework SQL Server support is available for Windows MAUI applications. Yes, absolutely it is. I can only find something working with SQLite. That's right. So the demos that you'll see people building for um, .NET MAUI, also for ASP.NET Core for that matter, um, are built and they typically target SQLite because it's available cross-platform and you don't need to install anything. It's just there. You can, you absolutely can use SQL Server with a .NET MAUI application using the SQL Server uh, Entity Framework packages, uh, right? Microsoft Entity Framework .SQL Server, and you'll be able to target and and interact with SQL Servers. So. Um, <clears throat> It's, they just, they, they build with SQLite because it's that common platform that everybody has. Ah, uh, thank you, Chris. Yes. Yeah, my, my Philadelphia Eagles just, just got squeaked out there in, in the final seconds with a field goal to lose by three. You have the latest Android 13? I don't know. Then, then I'm, <coughs> something else is going on there. To, with your compatibility, four oh four not found. Time to build a clip talk, mo clip talk mobile. Yes, it's coming. I I need to get on the other side of getting my database migrated. So, is there hot reload available for .NET Maui? It was pulled out of the current versions of Visual Studio. It was there and it's been pulled back. I'm not sure why, but I would expect to see it coming back soon. Um. Uh, you're welcome, Vidraz. Happy to answer your questions. Got about seven minutes left here in the AMA segment. Can I? Do I see use cases for Maui apps as a business application in B two C scenarios? Absolutely. And uh, does it integrate with Azure AD? Yes, you can integrate with Azure Active Directory, so that folks are required to log in before they access features. You can absolutely do that. That security isn't part of this series. Um, my friends James Montemagno and the .NET MAUI team and uh, the security folks on the 425 show can cover some of that content. Um, but at, for business applications in B2C scenarios, absolutely, because you can use .NET MAUI to build Windows and Mac applications. Build a tablet application to run on your um, your iPads or, or Kindle Fire tablets or uh, Samsung Galaxy tablets, absolutely you can do that and and deploy those using some of the internal deployment mechanisms for iOS and Android. Yes, yes, you can absolutely do that. 
Cold Hands has a question from YouTube. Cold Hands asks, why, uh, while unit testing SQL Server repository code, uh, what is the preferred way I can use mock Q framework to mock the database call, or I can use SQLite in-memory database and use conditional registration and startup? Depends. <laughs> the, the, these types of architectural questions, it, the, the answer is depends. Um, I like to mock repository objects when when I'm interacting with various other pieces of my code so that I can force the 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 application to behave the way I want it to. Um, you can use SQLite to stand up and test. Um, another way you can do that is you can use Entity Frameworks in-memory provider. There is a memory-based provider for Entity Framework that doesn't write anything to disk. And you can, and that's not SQLite. It's, um, find the, uh, find the sample for that. Uh, entity framework, uh, memory database. There we go. Yep. Microsoft entity framework core dot in memory. And, uh, show me, there we go. The in memory database provider. And here is a link to the docs about that so you can use that as well depends on what type of thing i'm testing if if i'm testing other application code that isn't intense on on how it's working with the database i'll mock i'll use mock you and mock out the repository if i am doing database intensive work where i want to write content and then read it back or write content interact with it and then read it back i'll use the in-memory database provider you certainly can use the in-memory provider for everything if you'd like. Um, I've also seen folks <clears throat> put together a test database, like using MySQL or Postgres or even MongoDB and, and seed it with data, load it with data so that it, it's in a particular state. Put that into a Docker container and, and save off that Docker image so that when they're testing, when they're doing integration testing, they can get a fresh copy of that Docker container and it has the same initial state of data every time. So then your application is working with a real database, but it's a database that's been set up for those scenarios. So as an integration test, not a unit test, but an integration test, setting up and forcing specific scenarios, that's kind of nice to do as well. I, I could absolutely see coupling that approach with a tool like Playwright, where you have scripts that are set up and configured to interact with your web application in specific ways and drive um, known responses and known expected uh, responses because you have the database configured a, a specific way. Glad to see your expensive DevExpress tools have .NET MAUI controls. Yes, they do. Um, they All of the component vendors have those out there. Um, thank you, Lewis. Appreciate you uh, jumping in there um, to help with map control feedback there. Um, is working on projects with MAUI uh, be heavier in Visual Studio than usual? No. No. It's... It, 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 you may think it's heavier, it's more intense, only because when you build with Visual Studio, it builds all the .NET code, but then it, it needs to render it and get it running in the local operating system of whatever, whatever device you're targeting, iOS, Android, Windows, so on and so forth. So, um, <clears throat> um, how you doing there? Babak asking, uh, what are some of the common reasons that a Blazor WebAssembly app is performance slows down? You have reasonable performance when debugging, <clears throat> but not when app is is .NET published, I'm guessing you're saying there? Um, I'm not quite sure. I need to dig in a little bit more there to see what, what you've done, um, how your application is configured. Big things that I would look for would be, um, did, were... Was there too much code linked and removed from the application? Do you have your application configured to do the tree shaking and linking, and did it remove too much? 
That that's the big change between debug and release mode. If you're running .NET 7 with that, it should be pretty um, pretty reliable, but I don't know. Cicero asking, is there a visual editor, standalone visual editor for XAML files? Um, it, take a look at Blend. That'll get you there. Databases are not real. It's all text files under the hood. Nah, nah, nah. The Sim Racers, good afternoon to you. Um, peeps, we have marshmallow, we have marshmallow chickens here. <laughs> New classic, is it the lack of implementation of basic features such as printing that seems to be preventing Maui from being ready for enterprise applications at this time? Um, you can absolutely get that capability uh, through reporting packages that you add in. Um, I could see that being being a gap that folks are saying, oh, I don't want to build an enterprise app with that. Um, print in Android. Uh, yeah, I would, I would say that would be a gap for folks on Android. Yes. Um, closing down the, the AMA here in just a few seconds here. XAML or C Sharp to design graphic parts? Since one overwrites the other, is there any... They don't overwrite each other. Is there any advantage using one of them over the other? No, there is, there is no advantage. One doesn't perform better than the other. Is it all, worth it to buy an online course for .NET or C Sharp? depends do do you learn well from watching youtube videos from folks like myself um or or from there's all kinds of services out there that do sell courses depends on how you learn i learn by reading i learn by reading the docs that's where my tutorials came from that i have over there i read the docs built things you with what i learned in the docs and what i learned and the shortcuts and the corners that i learned how to, how to work around, put together, and that's how I make my tutorials. So I learn by reading docs. If you learn by watching video, by listening to a teacher, then I would think it is worth it for you. Using in-memory database for unit testing won't be included in code coverage, right? Is there a way to get through that? What do you mean by included in code coverage? Yes, it would be included in code coverage. Your database code would be. Using um, a mock for a repository would not include the repository code for code coverage. Uh, docs are the source of truth, Neo. All right, that's that's the end of our AMA period. Thank you so much for all the questions. Um, I answer them to the best of my ability. I don't know all the topics. I, and certainly, you might be working in, in a corner of .NET framework or some of the tools that I don't have experience in, and I'd have to look them up, but um, happy to follow up with anybody that has a question. Drop me a line on Twitter, and uh, I can get you connected to folks that can that can help out a little bit more. Take care, Rishu. My goodness. Yeah, in Australia, it is a very late evening. All the best to you. We're going to get in. We're going to talk about a little bit of the nuts and bolts under, under the hood, right? We're going to, just like a car here, we're going to flip up the the bonnet right that that's what they say in europe we're gonna open the bonnet of the the car here the hood to to you americans and north american folks um we're gonna open the hood to and and look in and take a look at the engine and the various things that make a maui app go and we're gonna take a look at at some of those discuss it a little bit here and uh and then we're gonna we're gonna start in on on building this monkey monkey finder application that, that's a demo. It's a sample we've built um, in a in a bunch of the .NET Maui samples. But we're going to go through, step into it, and learn how to connect and start working with data. Um, the hood and the boot. There you go. I thought it was the bonnet. Yes, the bonnet. Ah, see that I got it right. Ha <laughs> ha! I've watched enough Jeremy Clarkson that I know the difference. <laughs> All right. Let's, um, I, I'm going to be working on this machine here in part because my, my daughter, my daughter swiped my other camera, the 4k camera that I have over here. I use for the, the standing set. She swiped it and, and has been using it for photography class in, in school. And, uh, so I'm going to be working here at the desk. So we'll have, we'll have fun with that. Um, so Let's uh let's dig in here. Um, 
I'm going to open, start with the, um, yeah, with the GitHub repository over here, and we will talk more. There we go. Look at that. Hey, look at that. Look at that cool transition. And I'm over here now. Right. So, um, why does Maui Blazor app have a web platform, but not web? Because you're, you're putting the web inside it. Maui's about building native apps. It's not one app and just decide to target all the things. So, yeah. Maui's about building native applications, not web applications. You take a web application and you put it in there. So, it's kind of a uh, inception thing there. So, um, like... Why would you build a Maui app that holds web to deploy to the web? So, love the new look. You like the beard? Um, I'm, I'm, I want to cut it off today. I want to, I want to cut it out. So, this is the repository that we work in for, for this series of videos here on this channel. Uh, GitHub.com slash C Sharp Fritz slash C Sharp with C Sharp Fritz. <clears throat> I'm working in, in branch 0602 today. Um, if you're watching the replay, we are we are not on 0602. You're going to find this in the main branch, but there you go. There's a link to exactly where I'm working here today. And inside of here, we have sessions. You can find all of the sessions that we've gone through. All the source code is in here. If you clone down the entire repository, here you go. 0602 is where we're going. We introduced .NET MAUI and took a, <clears throat> a quick tour around and looked at how we can build and work with those things. Um, and it it worked out nicely to, to learn and see, okay, here's a native app and it works in these environments. But today, we're going to go in and we're going to start talking about an overview of how this thing works. And starting to build a little bit to display data. Khan says, don't cut off the beard. Sort it out. I'm looking great. Well, thank you. I'm looking old is what I'm looking. I I can shave 10 years off the way I look by, by cutting this off. <laughs> um, so that that's a thing. Um, all right. .NET MAUI lets you build those native applications using a single project format, right? We, we have all the things we need to deliver that native application that works on all four operating systems, but it's in one project. We don't have to go and, and figure out how to target all the different platforms. It, it just kind of builds and lets you deploy to all those locations. So looking at this, I, I should mirror this so that I'm, I'm actually looking at the thing when I'm looking at it, right? What if we did that? Can we do that? Chat, can we, do you mind? Can we watch this? Watch this, ready? Um, yeah, 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 right? This is, this is the power of being your own producer. Watch this. Ha ha! Now I'm looking at it, but I'm, I'm over here a little bit too much, right? Can we do that over here? Okay. So, it, and now I'm actually looking at the thing that I'm looking at, right? Because it's whatever. Um, but it, I'm backwards. You wouldn't know it, though. Anyways, um, so looking over here, it's, it's a single project that targets all four operating systems, which simplifies our development process. You don't have to know and think about all these different technologies, right? We're talking about three, well, three different technologies to target iOS, Android. Mac OS is the same as iOS, but there are some concerns, some differences in how you build and deploy. And Windows, right? Three different sets of technologies that you need to be able to build and deploy with. So if we have one project with shared resource files within that one project, so that all those things that we need specific to each platform or that are similar between those, we can reuse and just put them down in locations to make it easy for 
for us as developers to see all these things in one place and be able to work with them together means that you can be more productive and you can communicate and collaborate with the folks that are trying to build and deploy to all the operating systems much easier. And you also have that single cross-platform entry point, right? We're, we're entering, we're building the application at one point and there are handoffs that you can sneak into and do different things on different platforms. You can inject platform-specific code for Windows, for iOS. Choose and drop those in there for whichever operating system you want. <clears throat> so, you can tell reverse because the .NET bot on the hat is the wrong way. Wait, no. But it's a perfect mirror. It's not... I see what you're doing there, Chris Jones. Um, so, first thing we want to talk about is resource files. So let's open up a project here. I'm going to start a brand new project here. Um, yeah, open a brand new Visual Studio. And let's um, create a new project. Right, let's move this over here. I'm going to create a new .NET MAUI app. Sure, MAUI app too. I'm creative in how I name my projects. And sure, give me .NET 7. I like .NET 7. At the time of this video, .NET 7 is the the released, most the most current version of .NET that's available. If you're watching this sometime in the future, if you're watching the recording, of course, uh, .NET 8, .NET 9, .NET 10, .NET 11 is available and you might be using that. And hopefully, some of these things that you're seeing here are still valid. Um... It, so, do I have any repositories the community can help out with and contribute to? Um, well, this one is open source. And uh, there are folks that will jump in and ask questions. There was a question that was asked coming into this one about identity. Um, that I need to go back and revisit asking about how to configure a specific provider. Um, but... You're welcome to jump over here. I do have some other repositories that are available to uh, to be contributed to Deck One. Um, so resource files. When we look at our project, we have a couple files. You see, actually, it's cut off there. Oh my gosh, my my tabs are cut off. Put them on the top there. There you go. So I have a couple files that are uh, listed that are available here by default, including an overview, telling you some documentation to help you get started. Um, links to beginner videos and documentation. But I want to talk about these resource files that we get here by default. And they, they make sense when you think about the resources that you want to put into an application that's going to be deployed to various platforms. So, right, we've got the application icon. We all need an, an icon to click on or to touch on our devices to launch the application. The various fonts, the images that are going to be used, splash screens, um, and any other styles that we want to define that are common across all of them that we want to put in a shared location. So we've got some styles for some basic colors that we can reference and load into our application, right? And styles, different ways that we may want to present uh, different tools inside of our application with some information about borders and heights and widths and these things. And you'll find that the settings that you get by default here, they're not bad. They're, they're pretty good to get you pointed in the right direction to, to build a consistent look and feel across the various platforms. Um, so... They're a good place to start, but it's available for you to customize for your needs and the way that you want your application to look. Um, and then we have the XAML files down here that define how we start up and load our application. And when you look at the docs here, it goes through and it talks about these things. Um, now, each one of those types has a different build action that goes with it. Let me show you. If you open up the project file, and our project file is a manifest that defines, here's all the things that make up our project, and 
how to package them so that they get deployed as as an app that you can download on from the app stores. There's there's things in here that you'll see, particularly down here in this item group, where it defines how the pieces come together, what should be included, and how they get packaged. So Maui icons, right? Where did where did my mouse go? Uh, are you kidding? Did I? What? Eh. Uh, no. There it went. It went flying by. I don't, I don't see. There it is. Um, so Maui icons, your, your application icons are marked with the Maui icon build instruction here so that it knows how to package it. And particularly when it gets to Android and iOS, they do some reformatting of how that, that image is structured in, and put it into the final finished rendered application. Um, the splash screen is the same way. And we recommend folks use an SVG for these so that as an SVG, it's scalable vector graphics. It will get scaled and presented appropriately for the various platforms. Because let's, let's face it, the shape of a tablet app, an iPad application, is different from the shape of a Samsung Galaxy flip phone, fold phone, right? The or Galaxy Pixel, uh, uh, no, Google Pixel, Samsung Galaxy. They're different shapes. They're not the same aspect ratio. So we need to scale and shape those various splash screens appropriately. Um, images are packaged similarly, and you see here by default, we include everything in the images folder. Grab all those images, package them up, and make them available inside the application. Same thing with fonts. Fonts are handled differently on different operating systems, so we want to make sure we handle that. And other raw assets, these are things like text files, um, JSON files, other things that you need packaged and delivered with your application are delivered with this Maui asset tag here. So they get, once again, handled appropriately for the different operating systems. Let me go to the question here. Um, questions in the chat. Um, Declan, oh, that's very kind. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, Honest Lee on YouTube asks, is XAML like CSS? No, XAML is a little bit more like HTML, but it's, it's designed to be more flexible um, and declarative for building native applications not HTML. That being said, many folks use um, the the Electron shell, right? The Electron application that's that's effectively um, the Chrome browser with a very thin frame around it. They package that with with Google Chrome and as an application with a little web server that goes with it, and they render HTML as an application. That's what Visual Studio Code is. That's what uh, the Slack application is. Discord, if you use the Discord application. Those are all Electron-based apps that are HTML to present native applications. Um, XAML is the way that we've been doing this with .NET technology since 2008, 2007, when WPF and, dare I say, Silverlight first came out. Ahmad asks, can we publish a Maui app um, or is it still buggy? No, you, you absolutely can um, publish Maui apps. It is, it, it's getting much more, much better performance and getting much more stable as uh, the team works and builds and adds new capabilities and new versions of .NET uh, and service releases are issued. It, HTML and XAML are two different markup languages. Yep. Yep. So, um, so, yeah. So, those are the things that we use to build and include these various references, these various resources that we have. So, if you want to package, package images, you drop an image in here and you can include information about what size that image is. 
and it will stretch and scale appropriately on the various target operating systems. And you see here there's base colors that you can put behind it so that it knows how to fill the background when it stretches. Things like the splash screen appropriately to fill the entire screen. So helps you kind of fake it out a little bit. Fonts, you can see there's a couple fonts in here. Uh, open Sans so that they're available to be used. Now they're, they're packaged here with the fonts tag but they, they still need to be registered so that so that Maui knows how to how to reference them and start using them. So if you look down here in the Maui program, they're configured with these two lines of code. And you're able then to reference those and include and, and grab that font to use in your user interface by using these um, shorthand names that are placed over here. So this is the full name as it exists on disk. And you can see there this alias, as it's referenced here in the um, in the tooltip, this alias, Open Sans Semi Bold, will get in reference and say, hey, use that format, use that font when I want to build my application. So when you when you look at some of the resources, so let's go to colors and styles. I'll go up here. Right, and if I look for Open Sans, there you go. So here, for a button, the font family by default on a button is going to use Open Sans regular font. And it doesn't, <clears throat> right, it's not the same full name with the font. It's just very simple here in defining what it is. So think about it. When you're building a native application and you're defining, well, here's my fonts, You could just say this is my standard font and everywhere just reference standard and when you decide you know what i don't want to use open sans regular i'm going to use arial i want to use helvetica whatever it might be you just swap out the font association there and all of your code just references and continues continues working while you've swapped out the font over here without changing the name everywhere that it appears throughout your code. Now, hopefully you are using um, things like a, a style um, repository here, right? Uh, resource dictionary with all your styles defined so that you can change them in one place and let that trickle down throughout all of them. Um, let me see here. <clears throat> Question on YouTube. Will Maui replace WPF and WinForms in the future? No. Um, WPF and WinForms have a very large install base um, and and ha are incredibly stable, have been iterated on and built on. WinForms is tw almost 25 years old now. Um, WPF is 15 years old, I want to say. Um, so <clears throat> you can absolutely use any of the three. Um, we, we would suggest, we would recommend if, um, if you are building and targeting new operating systems, you are targeting Windows 11 and you're building a new application, we would recommend you use .NET MAUI. So, does it only support TTF or will OTF fonts work? <coughs> Excuse me. I believe OTF fonts work as well. I believe they do. Um, is MAUI in pre-release now? No, MAUI is fully released. And you can use that. Uh, Maui and Blazor. Yes, you can do that. We're not going to cover that during today's session. So Maui plus Blazor is effectively the native web browser for whatever operating system you're targeting embedded inside of the application. And you're navigating around inside of that. Which means you can build and target as a web developer web content. And that works very well. So... All right, so that's a little bit about the fonts and the structure and how some of those pieces fit together. And um, why does it say image and font resources screenshot? It, I had that screenshot. I thought I included that. Um, is it still on my other machine? Did I just not get it deployed over here? I'll double check on that and make sure it's loaded. So, and there's the code that we looked at. Yep. 
You can use wildcard characters so that you have hierarchies of structure there. Yes. So this this content is all based off of... Um, I think I had it up front here. Yeah. Is based on the .NET Maui workshop. I've enhanced and tuned some of the content for what we're discussing and going through here today. Um, so, okay, we've gone through that. App icons. So, um, yep, Maui image is how you include those. There you go. True type format and open type font. Somebody was asking about OTF. There you go. It is supported. And we, <laughs> we did include that in the docs here. Splash screen, we talked about that. Raw assets. <clears throat> so if you want to include HTML and you want to include a browser component that shows that HTML content, maybe maybe you've got some sort of a credits page that's being generated in HTML or generated with Markdown and you want to include it and put it into your application, but generate that on the fly, right? You generate it, you drop it out there. You can include and put it there. Look at that. There's a web view that will reference those, and that's how you include it right there. So App Startup is actually built to look like ASP.NET Core. We've done a lot with ASP.NET Core, um, but it's built to look and feel the same. And for us as, for me as a web developer, this syntax, it looks, it, it looks and feels right to my web developer eyes that's been building with ASP.NET Core for five, six years now, right? We define an app, create Maui app. That's the name of our method. We're going to create some sort of a builder that has default configuration things in there that makes sense for 80 to 90% of the applications that we're building. And we say use Maui app and we pass in an, a class called app, which kind of makes sense. That's easy to, to follow, but app comes from, all right, I lost my mouse again. I've got mouse without borders running in it. Wanders right off to the other machine. So app derives from the application class. <clears throat> so here's app. If I F12 into that, you see it's over here. It's a new application, and it creates this thing called an app shell. App shell is another XAML file. So app XAML up here defines here's here's the thing. This is our application, and it has this resource dictionary that's bringing in those two default style, right? The colors and the styles for our application, so that those are available to us. And it's it's a merged dictionary. It's taking all that content mashing that together so that whenever you're building things in your application, the contents of these files are available. Think about it like, um, right, when you, uh, when you do web compressing, you do uglifying of your content for a web application. That's kind of what it's doing here. It's taking all the styles for those, mashing them together and making them available as a combined dictionary of styles for you. So, there's the application, and we told it to put a shell inside here, so here's our app shell. Now, I have a little bit more that I wrote about the app shell further down here with links to what a .NET MAUI shell is. Quite simply, a MAUI shell is a, a common frame, I'll say, a common host for all the things that we typically want to do in our applications. You, you want a single place to describe the visual hierarchy, right? You want to have that, that master page that says, that, right, every, I, I control the application. I have defined a single place that describes the visual hierarchy, how we navigate around. We're going to manage that common navigation experience. And look at this, a URI-based navigation scheme, because... Everybody does think a bit like web browsers now, going back and forth. And let's face it, your phone has a back button on it. So you want to be able to navigate back. Well, this will let you do that. And it also has an integrated search handler. So you can put search into your application. So we have this initial shell that specifies, here's, I'm going to handle 
the navigation, the presentation of this. And there is one element inside of here that's a shell content. Now, I don't know what the type of shell content is. That's defined inside of this thing, and it says it's going to pull that from main page. So the content in this content template tag is coming out of main page, and we're going to call this thing home. So if we're going to turn this into a tab bar or maybe a flyout menu, right? The menu that swipes in from the side of your mobile application or maybe a hamburger menu from the top corner, it, we're going to call this home. And the content of it, we're going to route, to, we're going to define a route called main page. And the content is main page. So we've built and defined, this is the address, this is the URL of this content inside of our application. So if we want to navigate back and forth, we can say, go open main page. And it's this thing defined over here. And it'll know to mark the home element as active when it's displaying this. If we go over to main page, oh, it picked up stream. If we go over to the main page, which I have open here, we see that our main page is content. It's just some amount of content and it contains a scroll view. So this is content that we can scroll through. There is a vertical stack layout. So all the things that are inside this tag, we're going to stack vertically. This is the amount of spacing and padding we're going to put between those. And we're going to center this vertically inside the user interface. So we have an image and this will be the .NET bot with a description that goes with it in case folks need to have a, a uh, reader read the content to them. We have a couple labels here that are going to be stacked underneath of it with the text, hello world, welcome to .NET multi-platform web UI. We have a heading level that goes with those and those are, <coughs> those help define the font and properties for that. And you see we have a font size here it's going to be centered horizontally. And then we have a counter button that appears underneath of it with the text, click me. Now buttons have clicked events on them. So it's going to trigger the on counter clicked event. And I'll press F12 to jump through to that definition. There's a counter, a, a, I'm sorry, there's a count variable here inside the main page. This partial class inherits from content page because this is a content page. And now we have our code that supports that. So when the page is created, initialize the components inside of it. That's kind of, kind of comes along for the ride. That You need that to start with here. And the event handler is here that says, well, here, when the counter is clicked, something is going to send that. We're going to receive some event arguments. And we're just going to update the text of that counter button. So if I F12 there, you see it jumps back into some generated code behind the scenes of this Maui button. That's generated based off of the XAML over here. So it's this button, and we're going to change the text on it by using the text property here. So our components that we're defining in our markup have a C-sharp representation inside the class that has the same name. You can see here, the files have the same name. Main page XAML, main page XAML.cs because it's the C-sharp that goes with it. And we can interact and change the content or, or add behaviors to those components. <clears throat> and for the purposes of making that easy to discover and navigate, Visual Studio will nest the C sharp file inside the XAML file. We can even open this up and see the name of the class and we can see the objects inside of that class made available to us so we can navigate directly to them if we wanted to. So there I double click on on counter clicked and it navigates directly to that method. Um, Zalef on Twitch asks, do you need to define the horizontal center on each element as an as an extra attribute there. Um, if I had used a style, if I had defined a style elsewhere, I could um, I, I could reference and say, well, 
this is the font size this is the horizontal options and f and have that just be inherited here so over here on my styles um so these are targeting various uh various types here the button right there's a def definition for the button and the checkbox date picker so if we scroll down i believe yeah there's label so there's default properties set here um i could absolutely say setter property equals um horizontal text alignment value equals center and now all of the labels with a horizontal will have a horizontal text alignment that says center and you can define other settings to kind of narrow down and say well only labels that have these uh this key set on it are configured and, and defined and will inherit and behave with this style applied to it we'll see that when we get into our demo here in a minute so um where'd it go yank that for right now so if i run this on my windows machine it runs and we will get so going to take a bit of time to build for the first time once it's the native stuff is built it takes a lot less to start so here there's the title home that we had defined for this piece of content inside of our uh, app shell right title is home and it points to main page so that title appears up top and there's our main page with the image right there's uh there's the image and it's stacked on top of two labels and a button image two labels and a button they're centered horizontally on the page and this is cut off a little bit here you know what what if i turn off the uh turn off the sidebar <gasps> better still not all the way across um let's see can i let me see if i can squeeze that a little bit there that is my main display <gasps> there it is um let me see i think I'm not going to be able to do this easily. Yeah, there we go. That'll, that'll do. There we go. So you can see the whole app there. So it is centered both horizontally and vertically inside the application because we had is a vertical stack layout and it's centered vertically. And these objects each are centered horizontally. So we get it nice and centered in the middle. So easy way to apply, apply those styles to appear there. How do you navigate between the files that way? What do you mean by how to? So when I'm here in Visual Studio and I want to navigate between the files, I can either click open uh, Solution Explorer and click through and, and actually click on those files to get there. Or when I was over here in main page and I want to navigate to the on counter clicked uh, definition, press F12 and it'll jump through right to that. Um, I can also press um, shift F7 and it'll go back to the markdown. And if I press F7 and it'll go to the code behind that markdown. So. as a keyboard person that's how i prefer to navigate between these and of course you can press Control t and just start typing the names of the things that you want so if i'm if i'm over here working inside my styles and i want to go to the program right i can jump to well there's the one for uh mac catalyst um if i want to go to the one at the top level there it is and it'll jump me, jump me right into it. And I can also um, type the names of those, right, on counter click, the names of the methods, and jump right to that method if I'd like. And that's Control-T. We'll get you into that. 
Shift F12 allows you to peak the definition without, and there you go, you can see the definition down here. Um, so, yep. Control T should be defaulted to Control Enter. So, there's different keys that different folks use for different uh, for different tools. You can pick up and configure Visual Studio to use whatever hotkeys you want. Control T happens to be the default for Visual Studio, but I know Control Enter used to be one in ReSharper. Was that it? I think Control Tab will Control Tab will take you between the various tabs that you have open here. So I can control tab, control shift tab to go back and forth through them. And I can also use the arrow keys once this window is open to navigate between these. So, um, yeah. And different folks like different hotkeys. It's up to you how you configure Visual Studio. Um, yeah, there you go. Alt F12 does the peak. There you go. Yep. So. All right. So that's just a little bit about the shell, a little bit about that configuration, how some of those pieces worked. We talked about the startup. Um, I talked about registering fonts briefly there. Um, and I think we're ready to take a look at displaying data. Yeah. You can reference it without the file extension, yes, or the alias. I like using the aliases just because it gives me that extra level of abstraction over what I might be... Uh, and, and right, if I change the name of the font later, I don't need to go hunting through all my code and replace it. So extra layers of, of, of abstraction always are going to help you solve problems faster in my mind. All right. Oh, good coffee. Um, let's get in. Let's start talking about the demo app we're building, and we're going to start with displaying data. And we're going to use a collection view to display data. This is, the, this is where we're going to get into building the Monkey Finder app. So I already have the app open right here. It's inside the source code with this repository. So if I back up here, so this is in the 0602, my images that go along, did the images load? Yeah, the images are there. I bet you it's a font size, font, not font, file casing issue inside that, re that doc. But inside the source folder here, you'll find the sample code, the starting version of the sample code to work with for this project. I already have this open, um, so let's jump over to that and start talking about displaying data. Now, I've already opened the project. You're going to want to restore the packages for this. It, quite frankly, you shouldn't have to do this. It should do this for you automatically when you start the application, but choosing restore NuGet packages here should restore any package references you need to run this application. Um, I, I clicked the run button up here and jumped through that without really digging into this a little bit. Um, there's a drop down arrow next to this and you can choose the various... <clears throat> yes, the code is under 0602 folder. Um, and you'll see the source there. So there's the uh, URL if you want to click and jump right to it. So, uh, not that one. So up here, you can <clears throat> choose to build for other frameworks. You can choose to target various emulators. So if I build this right now, it's going to build this initial monkey app, monkey finder app for Windows. And there we go. I get the ye this yellow bar. That's the primary color for our app. And there's, there's nothing in the middle, and it's built for Windows. Let's try my Android emulator that I already have set up here. And if I click build for that, it's going to start the emulator. You can see right down. 
Well, it's just below. And it is running now. It's running an old app that I was testing and building with here. And it is running. It's going to finish packaging and deploying here. You can see the little... Ah, it's just off the bottom of the screen. There's a little thing that's building and, and working here. So once you first get the application running, there you go, it'll build and deploy to Android and uh, iOS devices easier. So here it goes. But this is that second step where it needs to render and get these things into the right format for the various operating systems. So there we go. There we go. Getting everything ready for Android. While that's finishing here, it's uh, Brunha asks, aren't SVG types of image more flexible to suit the different device sizes? Yes, exactly. And that's exactly what's going on here. <clears throat> so there's my monkey zap. There's nothing in it yet, but it's running on Android in addition to Windows. So I have my choices here. I can bounce around and work with Android Windows appropriately. So I'm just going to close and we're going to start going through and looking at this. You'll see here, this only has one font registered, Open Sans Regular. And um, if we look at the resources, you'll see there aren't any styles in here. We put all the styles for this one over here in the app shell. And there you see the background color is the primary color, this yellow. Um, and there inside AppSAML is where all the resources are for this application. So I have, there's my colors with the various keys defining the names of these things. So if I look through at my main page, uh, no, it wasn't the main page, in the app shell, right? So the shell background color uses static resource primary. It uses the primary color there for the background color. All right. So it's it, it's got these lookups to define here's the colors, here's the fonts, the types of things that we want to work with. Amal asks, so for Android, does it basically convert C sharp code to Java bytecode? Yes. Mm -hmm. That's exactly what happens. So when we go back to thinking about how .NET works, you write C sharp code, it compiles and delivers it as intermediate language code. In Java, they call that bytecode. In .NET, we call it IL, or intermediate language code. And when you deploy that and it runs on, on Windows, Mac, or Linux for a console application or a web application, there's a last-minute, just-in-time compile that happens of that IL that turns it into native code that runs on those operating systems. When we're talking about Android or iOS, you don't have a runtime that's sitting there that, that can do the just-in-time compile. We have to deliver completely running, uh, completely runnable native applications. To do that, we have to take that, that last-minute just-in-time compile that's done, and we have to front-load it and native compile all the way down to the appropriate binary instructions for those processors for that operating system. So that last step that happens before it deployed, and you saw it there in my output window, you see that it is getting it ready for Android. It's taking those DLLs and, and mashing them together so that it can work. And look, setting up all the configuration of it with the mono runtime. There we go. And compiling, putting it in the right format and bundling it appropriately for Android. So all the things that are needed and same thing happens for iOS. Um, Kleiber asks, why is the collection view slow? It's not slow. Come on now. Depending on the amount of data and, and how it's loaded, couldn't can affect that. I'm also running inside of a simulator here for Android. Um, native Windows should be much, much faster. How you doing there, Rizwan? So, 
let's start setting this up so that we can bind to a collection of data. And we're going to be presenting information about monkeys in the collection view here. So I've already covered a little bit about the shell. And you can see the monkey finder shell. I included the source code here about how this is configured so that it's not using it's not using a flyout menu, but instead we'll be using a tab based menu later on as we add more pages. So um, we're going to put together a model so that we we get ready for MVVM type of architecture here. But we're going to put together a model for monkey data. And inside of our model folder, we have a monkey object. And it doesn't, it doesn't have any properties yet. The, the properties, the content of this is available here inside the raw folder. We have monkey data dot JSON. Double click and open that and you'll see here's the JSON format of the data that we're going to load. Now, this could be loaded from a web service. It's in it's an array of uh, entries about monkey and that monkeys and that absolutely works well if we want to load this data from from a, a RESTful service, from an Azure function, an ASP.NET Core API, you could output this. Those are topics for another time to build and how those services work. For our purposes, this is how the data is being presented to us. I'm going to copy that, go over to that monkey. Let's delete this for, eh, let's just comment it out for a second. And I'm going to use the paste special feature here inside of um, Visual Studio to paste that JSON that I've copied as classes. And it generates the appropriate class structure here for me. Now, I don't want to call it class one. I want it to be monkey. So I'm just going to delete that, put them together. So now I have a monkey class that has all the properties that are inside that JSON file. So when I go to load data from that JSON file into a monkey object, they'll match up. They'll load and properly bind to that type for me. On YouTube, Amal asks, what's the curly brace syntax in XAML? Is that similar to the at syntax in, um, in Razor? So if I go back over here, you're particularly referring to here, yes. That is similar to the at syntax. It's it's saying bind this data. Take this data and, and bind it. Define how and where to find this and, and connect and put the value from inside that thing here. So static resource, it's looking for those static resources that are defined here in our application resources. And it's looking for something called primary. Well, there is a color called primary, so it grabs that value, Fox, Fox, Charlie, 107, and it outputs it there, and you see we get a little color swatch hint of what that is. So, um, it, it's that one-way reference to bring it back. What's with the monkeys? Yeah, that, that's, that, that was the, the Xamarin mascot, and, and we still use it for .NET Mali, so... Um, so that's how we reference and bring those in. So I've got now a monkey object to find a model for this, right? And that's a little bit more thinking like a C sharp developer in, in setting up model objects that I'm going to bind to data to present in a user interface. So let's talk about binding to that data. There's the paste special, the monkey. So we want to display data inside of our main page. In order to do this, we need to be able to first make that model folder, the contents of that available to that to us. XAML is an XML language, so in order for it to find that content, we need to add a namespace for the model folder. So it knows here's where to go to look this up. So I'm gonna go over here to main page. I'm gonna close everything but this and add right there. So we have an XML namespace called model, and it points to, inside the CLR, this C-sharp, this .NET namespace, monkeyfinder.model. So 
it knows to look in that namespace, which is where the monkey class lives. So I can reference and build with that on this screen. And we're gonna add a collection view here. I'm gonna just copy this content out, paste it in and we'll talk about this. So a collection view is a collection of content that we're going to display using a template, an item template down here. We have, we can optionally define some in memory, some hard coded source collection of data. And in this case, we're defining an array and that array is of type monkey. That looks a little weird. This is an array, it's X, right? X is an array extension and we're gonna define and grab that array, right? So there's the X namespace that reaches into XAML and we grab an array of type and there from the model namespace monkey. If I delete this, I can control space and you'll see it knows the types that are inside there. So I have a model monkey. So here it's it's declaring one of these objects and here's the attributes of it. In this way, we're defining the type and we're, we're declaring our sample data in our user interface. We then have a the actual item template that we're gonna define that says here's how to render it. And that is gonna be inside of a data template of data type monkey. So we're working with a monkey, so we're gonna reference and bind to these various properties of the monkey class. So all of these properties over here are now attributes that we can connect, bind to, and display. We had a vertical stack layout earlier. Here's a horizontal stack layout. Padding 10, so we're gonna have on the left side to start, we'll have an image. And we'll fill that image with whatever shape this is. And we're gonna request 100% um, by 100%, uh, I'm sorry, 100 pixels by 100 pixels. And we're gonna bind to whatever the image is. And in this case, you see the images coming out of GitHub user content and our friend James Montemagno's repository. And there's some uh, images laying out there that it's going to grab and bring into this layout. So there are three monkeys here. We have a template that's defined for how each of those three monkeys will be presented. So we have an image and then horizontally next to that image, so to the right of it, we have a label and inside of that we have a label text. So we're gonna send her vertically and we'll have this text of this format. So there's a, um, a positions defined here, zero and one, so counting in .NET begins with zero. So at position zero is the name and then we have location. So we'll have name and location. And that's the end of our layout. So with just those couple little pieces in there, I'm going to turn this over back. Nah, let's see how it runs on the pixel. So it's going to restart the emulator. There's the previous version of it. It's going to finish binding and it'll deploy and rerun over here. So there it goes. If I don't close it next time, we won't have to pay for pay, pay the time penalty of waiting for it to restart. So There it goes. There it goes. I was going to say, it's not done yet. And the finish build and deploy. Fantastic. Stops the old app. And it'll start running the new app in just a second. There we go. And there's my three monkeys that I defined in the settings up here. Baboon, uh, location Asia and Africa. There's the vertical pipe, Asia and Africa. Capuchin monkey, Central and South America. And the red shank duke. And there it is in Vietnam. So 
we've got our, our monkey's leg Xamarin, actually. Uh, so there they are. They're defined and looks good. We can take this label and instead of having them side by side like this, we've got a lot of vertical space here. We can change that to a vertical layout and I have the source code for that. So I have the image and I have a vertical stack layout here for those monkeys. So if I take this, right, and replace it with that content. So now we have the horizontal stack layout. There's the content for our image, it's the same. And then instead of this text over here next to each other, it's a vertical stack layout and it's gonna center it vertically. And we're going to bind the name to the text of this label and we'll bind the location to the text of the lower label so we don't have that vertical pipe so i will save that now this this won't hot reload i actually need to yeah i actually need to restart this to get it to pick up those changes but it should deploy in patch a little bit faster this time .NET explode? No. <laughs> so, I have a feeling we're going to end up going through this, <clears throat> this series of demos, these capabilities, a little bit faster than the original workshop. So, there it goes through all the targets. Found the device that will deploy, and we'll see. We should see our monkeys updated over here with that new layout. There it goes. And now they have these larger font sizes with an appropriate text color and presented vertically. So it looks a little bit nicer. And we've just taken those first steps to, to get content laid out and appearing up here. Well, what happens if we get that running? And I, I believe the app is still here on the device. Yeah, there it is. There they are. If we, we can still run it over here and debug on the Windows machine and see what that looks like. We need to change the status bar to yellow also for consistency. We can do that. So there you go. There's the Windows version of the app. And there's the Android version of the app. So we got them side by side and we can see exactly how that Stat that uh, title bar is reflected across both. Um, <clears throat> the status bar, I forget where the status bar is. I forget where you set the value of the status bar. But you can change that default can, uh, color and make it appear however you'd like. Uh, I don't know. Hot Reload hasn't worked uh, here on any of my... Um, Visual Studio 17.5s, David. So, um, not quite sure. Hey there, Greg. Welcome. Um, so, that's all I wanted to cover today. That's the basics of getting started, putting data on screen, getting it laid out properly, a little home screen with some data that we're going to be able to look up. Status bar has to use the community toolkit. And it is installed, so we'll, we'll get that updated. And actually, I think it's in a later. I think it's in a later uh, step here in the uh, in the workshop because we have light and dark mode capabilities that we're going to turn on. But we've got our app. It runs on Android. Runs on Windows. I'm going to finish getting. I have a an iOS device here. I'm going to finish getting this configured an iPhone. This is an iPhone I think it's a XR um, that we're going to get loaded up so that we can deploy and see it running on a uh, on a uh, uh, iPhone. How would you show in Windows but in three columns as Kleiber? I wouldn't use the, the collection view. I would use a uh, I would use a different uh, collection there. What there's a grid view I think that'll do that. Or I forget what the different collections are that'll make them appear. So we'll, we're going to be tinkering and, and showing those. Look at that. Adding the page behaviors content. Um, 
that Declan is suggesting. All right, let's copy and paste that in. Um, I don't mind doing that. So I'm going to go over to App Shell and drop that in. I think that's where it goes, right? Um, I don't, is the toolkit in this yet? We need to add the toolkit um, namespace. Um, what is the Maui community toolkit namespace? I forget what it is. Look at that. You beat me to it. Wow. Wow. We'll drop that in. And it should pick up and... Right, I think... Come on. Is it? I thought it was in here. It's not installed yet. Uh, I don't want to get too far ahead of myself in installing it and showing it. Um, we'll get to that be uh, next time. I, I know I can do it with NuGet, but I am just about out of time. Let me head back over to the main screen. And uh, yeah, we will be sure to be talking more about the community toolkit. It's coming up in the next the next stream or two. Um, so let me head back over here. Pause the music. Thank you. Um, all right. We covered a handful of topics there quickly. We went through, we set up, we deployed. And, and walk through some of the basics of where our resources inside of our application reside, how we interact with them, how they get compiled and included in our project. We saw how all those pieces fit together. We also saw how we can write a little bit of XAML and read data and, and parse some of that data and put it into a user interface so that it binds to that data renders it and we can put those um put that content back and forth right bind it read it out of that data into a strongly typed object our monkey class and wire that directly into some user interfaces if i would do a commit that would look good uh you're on the main branch i haven't merged the 0602 branch yet um i'm going to verify some of the uh some of the images weren't appearing there in the markup. I'm going to make sure that those are all verified and working. But Morse, you're right. It's not merged yet. You're looking at the main branch. Pull down the the branch in the corner. And choose 0602 and you'll see this one. Um, but next time we're going to get into and build more into this. We're going to add some detail click throughs on these. A little bit more navigation back and forth. So that we can, we can interact with the application. And I'm hoping to get the iOS device up and running so that we can work with that as well. Yeah, thank you for the link, Declan. So I'm not committing the end version of the application into the source code. I want you to get the beginning version. You'll have the end version of from today in what will be the next folder 0603. So thank you so much for tuning in. This is a lot of fun building this. I've got lots more content available if you want to talk about web development. Also, in the playlist on YouTube, check out the playlist down below. It's probably over there as well if you're watching on YouTube. Um, there's lots of great videos in this series, Build uh, Learning C Sharp with C Sharp Fritz. I will be back tomorrow and Thursday over on my Twitch channel, answering questions, doing work with Blazor and Azure live. If you want to check in and talk more about those, happy to join you over there. Um, 9 a, same time I started here, 9 a.m. Eastern, um, 6 a.m. Pacific. What is that, 1400 UTC? So thank you so much for tuning in. If you're watching on YouTube, have a fantastic rest of your day. Check out, check out more of the videos that are over here and down below, all right? Make sure you click that subscribe button for the .NET channel so you know when there's more content coming. And of course, if you're watching on Twitch, let's set up for a raid. Let's go connect to some other folks 
that are streaming out on the big Twitch TV network. So we can follow up and learn more from, from them on some of the other cool technologies that are out there that people are building with. And looking around the horn here, I think we're going to get connected to... <laughs> let's head over to our friend Tim Bodet, who's who's coding with Unity. Unity is a game engine that you can build with using C Sharp. And Tim, Tim is building, it looks like, he's building a version of Excitebike. Um, very cool looking. So let's get you over... Yep, there's the link to Tim. So I will click through the raid command... Thank you so much, everybody, for tuning in. Um, hope you have a fantastic rest of your day. I wish you good health and good coding. Take care. <laughs>